Aquarium. So we're really looking forward to hearing lots from you. And I'd like to start off today's presentation by saying how grateful I am to be able to connect with all of you from Vancouver, BC, the traditional territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil people who, since time immemorial, have been using practices of storytelling and observation and learning about the environment around them. And teaching all of those skills to our community far and wide. And so everyone at OceanWise Research and OceanWise Education is so grateful to be able to incorporate those practices in what we do. And so whether we're connecting with you online through our virtual live streams like today's Tales from the Deep program and more of what we have streaming from ocean.org learn online, um, as well as getting out into the wonderful kind of neighborhood of Vancouver and wherever you might be this summer. We hope that you can be inspired by those ways of learning um, in everything that you do as well. So we're really excited to be joined by Andrea today. And I know that she has lots of wonderful stories to tell and share about her work with our animals in the tropics. And so I think you should have your ability to screen share now, and I will turn it over to you. The floor is yours. I'll be here monitoring the chat if anyone needs anything. Okay, just give me one sec here. I'm gonna share my, see if it happens. Oh, oh no. Okay. I'm not seeing anything just yet, but sometimes it's a little slow to come through. It's on my screen. Oh, see? there we go. Yeah, it just okay. needed a few extra minutes. Okay, so uh, somebody says it's very hard to hear me. Um, okay, it's great. Okay. So thanks, Danica. Um, I'm very happy to be here with uh, all you guys. I'm actually coming to you live from my home in Squamish. So I want to just apologize in advance if you do hear uh, a dog. Um, she is sleeping at the moment. But she does occasionally bark at things moving outside. So you may hear that. Um, I do have another surprise guest for later, uh, later on when I'm talking about uh, something else. And uh, so we'll leave him for last. Um, but yeah, basically, um, online learning came to me and just asked if anyone was interested in doing a, a program about anything we wanted, really. And I thought it'd be a really great idea to talk to people a little bit about what exactly the biologists at the aquarium really do. Because uh, I, I get that a lot um, on, on a relatively regular basis, um, because people just, you know, they often think, well, you get to play with animals all day. That's so cool. And like, I wouldn't use the word play, um, but I really wanted to just showcase like kind of all the really hard work that not just the people in the tropics department are doing, but what all of the animal care people are doing at the aquarium and uh, just really show what kind of things we really do. So first of all, this is gonna work. I'm scared to touch anything. <laughs> okay, here we go. So what exactly is the tropics department? So there's actually three different animal departments at the aquarium. There's the tropics, there's the Canadian waters and propagation team, and then there's our marine mammal team. So the tropics team looks after all of the tropical fish you would see if you've been to the aquarium. So that's all of our tropical freshwater and tropical saltwater fish and critters that live in those type of environments. And then also our Amazon gallery, which is our free flighted, uh, ex basically jungle type exhibit where you'd find all kind of our terrestrial animals. Um, so we have a very diverse group of biologists in those teams that's able to care for those different animals. So it's, it's quite an interesting team to work with. And you know I've been very honored to work in that department for quite a long time, but we'll get to me a little bit later. So I just wanted to show you a few photos of uh, just some of the things that, uh-oh, my mouse is, there we go. Um, just some of the, some of the exhibits and animals that we do have in the tropics. 
Uh, so you can see your screen, that's our rescued green sea turtle. She lives in our very large uh, tropical saltwater uh, shark habitat. Um, she's a lot bigger than the sharks that live in there. Um, and she likes to make that place her, her home. Um, but she's a really lovely turtle uh, that's been with us since 2006. Uh, on the bottom right of the or left of the screen there, you'll see um, one of my favorite fish, a porcupine fish. Uh, he lives with our uh, lionfish exhibit, just pretty close to the sharks. Right in the big center photo there, that's one of our cylinder um, habitats that we have. That's our freshwater cylinder. Um, it's not that easy to get in and out of. I can say that from experience, but it's a, it's a really cool exhibit. You can see all the way around. Um, we also have different corals and anemones, which you can see in some of those other photos. Um, so we have quite a diverse collection. Uh, you'll even see the, you know, people call them Nemo fish, but uh, the clownfish exhibit is definitely a, a big hit with lots of people. Um, so we have quite a diverse collection of, of animals. Um, on the left there is our um, fly river turtle. Uh, he's a really, really um, very curious turtle. And so lots of people really love to come and see him. Um, and he lives in this really large exhibit when you first walk, walk into the tropics gallery um, with a few different species of rainbow fish. <laughs> yeah, Piku is the, that turtle's name. Um, so very, very popular little guy. And then on the right, which is just actually across from the Fly River exhibit is our giant fish exhibit. So that houses um, uh, the Arapaima, which again is one of the uh, big hits of, for people to come and see such a big fish. And I have to admit that I'm a little bit nervous sometimes when I go up to that. It's a really, really big fish. Um, but just so you can, everybody can see, like we do have quite a few different animals so i'm i'm trying not to be really biased in this program but i do have a reptile bio, uh, a reptile background so i'm slightly biased towards reptiles as that's where i got my start um, but on the left is one of our um uh terrestrial exhibits in the amazon that's our emerald tree boa exhibit so you can see her at the very top there bright green snake uh, so apologies if people are a little bit nervous of snakes. I hope that I can change at least one of your minds that snakes are cool. <laughs> um, yeah, and then you can also see on the right there just just another variation of some of our freshwater exhibits. Like we try and exhibit uh, different areas from all around the world um, to really show people that like it's not just some sand or rocks and some water and some fish in it, but the environments that fish and other animals live in are completely different and it takes um, a lot of different people to be able to do that. Okay, who am I? So I just wanted to give you a little bit of idea of how people actually become biologists because it's not as easy as it seems, just like any job. Um, and sometimes it's a little bit of just being in the right place at the right time. And uh, I'll embarrass him a little bit because I think he's actually watching, but. <laughs> but my boss is actually watching this right now, and it took almost a little bit of um, persistence, I would say, to uh, get where I'm at today. Um, so there's just a few photos of me. Uh, I've been at the aquarium since 2007, and I actually got started there uh, in the admissions department. Uh, department, and um, I worked there for quite a few months until I finally annoyed my boss to give me a part-time job in the tropics. And it was probably the best day of my life, other than a few other things that have happened throughout that time. Um, but ever since then, uh, I've been working in the tropics uh, section, um, mostly in the Amazon. And uh, so, as you can see on the left there, I, I had a really um, strong uh, affiliation with snakes. Um, I got plugged into the reptile section. And at first, I was a little bit nervous about that because I... You know, I had kind of, I mean, lots of people have a, a, a mammal and bird bias, um, which, you know, is, is pretty common with a lot of people, but I find that uh, reptiles are really cool and there's so much we don't know about them and they're very misunderstood animal. And I thought this was really gonna be my opportunity to um, show people why we need reptiles and really kind of change people's minds. And I 
really ran with that mindset. So I've been a part of a lot of different programs and um, uh, different blog posts. Um, I've been on TV a few times, just showcasing our the wonderful animals that we have, like snakes, and really bringing them to light. Um, you know, because of a lot of things that I've done with the team, yeah, we were able to bring back our snake programming on a regular basis. And it just, it's really cool to see people change their minds and really have that impact on people, why they should care about something that otherwise five minutes ago that they didn't. And uh, um, it's really also awesome just to be a part of a team like that, where, um, you know, you can inspire people and show them why they should care about interesting things like snakes and even butterflies like there on the right when we brought back our butterfly exhibit last year. And, um, you know, every day I learn something new and it's, uh, it's pretty crazy to think that you can learn something new every day being in the job that you are thinking like, well, what else am I going to learn? Well, <laughs> there's a lot of things that you can learn um, in all these years. And so uh, it's been a really fun time. And uh, so, yeah, I just wanted to show you what biologists actually do now. So like I said before, we often get like, oh, you get to play with the animals and you get to feed them all day. That's so cool. Um, but honestly, feeding animals is probably one of the smallest parts of our job. Um, depending on which section you're in, you spend a lot of time cleaning their habitats. You spend a lot of time making food for them. You spend a lot of time figuring out what you should feed them and figuring out what else they need in their habitat to help them thrive. So honestly, like the feeding part of it is is quite small. It's a really great reward because it's really fun and, and pretty awesome to watch different animals eat things. Um, so I get like why people really like that part of it. Um, but not just biologists, we're plumbers, we're electricians, we're, uh, we're dietitians, nutritionists, we're doctors, we're pretty much every job under the sun biologists do. And we do have a, a other departments within the aquarium that definitely do help us with all those kinds of things. Um, but sometimes we have to rely on our own devices to be able to do stuff like that. So I'm just gonna kind of talk a little bit about things, but I'm just gonna show you a different array of photos of people doing some things and just some of the exhibit work that we've done. So in a place like the Amazon gallery, we also have to be horticulturalists. And so most people that come to work with us, you have a very strong animal background and plants are kind of like, oh yeah, I've got like a fern in my house or, you know, I eat plants or whatever. <laughs> so you have to really kind of figure out that plants are a really big part of not just the Amazon, but all of the um, sections within the tropics team. Um, plants play a really big role in most environments in the world, and um, it's just it seems to be a little bit bigger in the Amazon itself because we have such a large gallery that houses lots of plants. So it's uh, it's definitely been a challenge for for all of us to get where we're at. But um, Jen there on the left, she's uh, one of our newer biologists. Um, she's only been with us for just over two years now. And she's actually one of our main um, plant people in the Amazon now, along with a couple other things that she does. Um, but it's like I said before, it's it's really just learning every day and and trying new things and figuring out why we need this plant and not that plant. And we have to be really careful about what kind of plants we use because some animals don't like those ones or they will eat them even though they're not supposed to eat them. And uh, we have to be really cautious about stuff like that. We also have to make sure that they're Amazonian in nature because it is an Amazon gallery. And it's really hard to find Amazon plants. Um, but it's a really neat, neat part of it. And I think most, most of us biologists would say that that's probably one of our most favorite things is, is actually setting up the habitat or figuring out what kind of habitat an animal wants to live in. So example on the right there, uh, that's one of our newer exhibits. Um, in kind of the center of the tropics gallery um, with those are all live plants in there. And uh, it took two tries to get that going. Um, but Mike, one of our senior biologists in the freshwater section, he's really big into planting uh, and using plants and exhibits. And um, it's, it's really rewarding to see something like that at the very end, like that 
that you've really mimicked this kind of environment where these fish are going to live. So um, we do spend a lot of our time actually making habitats work. Um, let's see, go on here. Um, so I tried to make this uh, video. Uh, it was it was a video, but it was it was just going to take forever. So on the left there, um, this is me so-called watering um, one of our snake vivariums. And so uh, lots of our snakes are actually arboreal snakes. So they live most of their lives in, in trees. So they don't actually really go down to the ground to drink very often. So they like to drink from when we artificially rain on them. So we're not actually watering the animal, which some people think we're doing. We're actually watering the plants and creating humidity in their exhibit, uh, which is very important in the Amazon. But we, um, we direct it near them because the snakes like to come and drink the water. So you, it's really, I know it's really not the best picture, but it's just showing you that this is kind of the stuff that we're doing every day. We're watering exhibits, we're, we're siphoning out some of our habitats to clean uh, the sand or the rocks. Um, on the right there, you can see our, some of our tortoises. So we have to make really interesting ways, um, uh, presentations of food. So. Some animals like to eat things that are hanging. Some animals like to eat things that are scattered amongst the ground. Like some fish only eat things off the ground. Some fish only eat things um, on the surface. So it's, we have to be creative in the ways that we feed some of our animals. It's almost like being a, uh, I guess, food decorator. Um, one, one of the more fun parts of our job and um, something that during the pandemic, actually, while we were closed, we got to spend a lot of time about uh, a lot of time with our animals, which was, um, you know, we do spend obviously a lot of time with our animals regardless, but um, we got to walk like say our macaw here on the left. We got to walk him around the galleries and really spend some true quality time with him. So um, Ollie here on the left, he really loves to play peekaboo. <laughs> so Siobhan there is using that box to <laughs> move it around and he was just having great great time doing that but for people in the, like something in the amazon a lot of our animals require something called enrichment and you've probably heard that word before and really that word can be applied to any animal that we care for it's just a different definition um in whatever aspect you're you're doing that so enrichment could be a, uh, a shelter or moving sticks this way or rocks this way for because fish want to hide in here or in this case it could be it you know holding a box up to a bird or giving him said box so he can shred it into a million pieces because they like to shred things um but really take it that next step further and that's why we're all really amazing at what we do because we aren't just giving them food and shelter and, and water we're giving them that part of life that they that actually makes their life um, well for them. So it's one of these really cool moments that I just wanted to share with you guys because um, it was it was pretty hilarious seeing him bob up and down like that. Um, yeah. So some of the other things that we do here. So I'll get to that plastic picture in a minute, but. Um, we have quite a few divers within our biologist teams and we have to go into the exhibit. So just like you would clean your room or you'd vacuum your floor, we have to go into these exhibits and scrub them ourselves. So this is Austin, one of our saltwater biologists and um, relatively every week he, he goes into this, uh, one of our saltwater cylinders and he scrubs that entire uh, work you see in the middle there. And so this takes quite a few people to do, and you actually have to use a scissor lift to get you to the top of that exhibit to be able to then dive in there. So it's pretty crazy some of the things that we we do that people just don't really think about. But think about how many times you have to clean your house or your room or or your dishes or whatever, right? So we're doing those things for for the animals on a almost every, pretty much everyday basis, depending on what it is. Uh, so that's one of the more interesting ways that we uh, clean exhibits. On the right there, I was just showing that that um, you may not always see what's happening behind the scenes, um, but we also do a lot of work behind the scenes in terms of 
making habitats look better, changing them. So we were doing some painting in one of the exhibits down the hall from where this plastic is. So we have to put this stuff up so that it protects the animals that breathe air so that they're not breathing in uh, any of the bad stuff. Uh, so, and we use ladders, we use all kinds of different tools and stuff to help us do things. So it's really not just looking after animals, it's doing stuff like this behind the scenes to make all the exhibits look great for people that come to um, enjoy them with us. And then I, I really like walking around with Ollie and just taking photos with him in it. So he's just you know, photo bombing pretty much everything. <laughs> um, but he uh, he's here in front of our monkey exhibit. And uh, I should probably point out that a lot of people ask why we have an Amazon gallery at an aquarium. And the easiest answer to that is that the Amazon rainforest is the number one source of fresh water in the entire world. So it makes sense to have that and a rainforest at an aquarium. Um, so even though these animals aren't aquatic, they all rely on water, just like we rely on water. Uh, the monkeys don't really like going in hot, but <laughs> they like, and they don't like being um, rained on at all, but you know, they tolerate a little bit of mist here and there. Um, we do have a small family group at the aquarium and uh, Ollie's just here hanging out with them. They're very curious about whatever you're doing. And then here on the right, just showing some of the feeding tactics that we have to do. So this is one of our ponds within the Amazon gallery. And we have a really cool turtle in there called the Mata Mata turtle. And uh, so Mike there has to use these long tongs to get a fish down to the turtle to feed, to feed her. Um, so it's, it's quite interesting all the strange things that we have to do. Again, yeah, there's Ollie photo bombing again back in front of the the fish fish exhibit there. Um, like I said before, you know, it's 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 just as enriching for Ollie as it possibly is for those fish because oftentimes when we walk past there, they recognize that we're we're there and um, it intrigues them to what what we're doing. Like obviously, we have no idea what the animals are truly thinking, um, but um, you know, uh, oops, sorry, Ollie. Uh, all I love going for walks and exploring and seeing different things. And then it also gives us the opportunity to um, sit in front of our exhibits and really uh, take them in ourselves. Okay. I kind of talked about what biologists really do. Um, I wanted to just briefly mention, how do you even become a biologist? So most of the people that work within the animal care teams have some sort of post-secondary education. And uh, I realize that's a little bit different these days now with, with what's happening in the world. Um, but yeah, most of us have like a biology or zoology background. Um, some of us have very specific um, diplomas or certificates in some sort of animal care field. But really what it comes to experience. Um, so anybody can walk, well, most people can walk out of a university or a college or whatever, whatever it may be and you know, here's my piece of paper, but it, you really need those hands-on skills to, to be able to do something like what we do. And um, so from the youngest age, if you wanna be a biologist, you wanna work with animals, the best advice I can give you is to start like immediately if you haven't already, just get as much animal care experience as you can. So that could be volunteering at say something like MMR, or when we're able to have volunteers back at the aquarium volunteering with us. Lots of the people that, that I work with now, they started out as volunteers. Pretty much almost everybody on my team started as volunteers of some kind. So it's, it's a really great way to, to learn about it and really decide, do I wanna be a biologist? Do I really wanna do this? Because it's not always as glamorous as everybody makes it out to be. I mean, my hair is done today, but normally it's not, and it's hot, and it's lots of work, um, but it's very, very rewarding. Um, so as much animal care experience as you can get, um, I mean, if you can get a job somewhere that has animals, anything like that is really, really helpful. Um, but definitely volunteering with the aquarium or MMR is, is a good start.
Um, so then I wanted to kind of end this on how, how do we take what biologists do and really inspire visitors to want to do something with the information that they just got from us? And what do we actually do at the aquarium as biologists that's helping our environment? So there's lots of things that we actually do behind the scenes that lots of people may not know that we're doing. Um, or they might know, but they're just not quite sure, like kind of how much we are really doing. So, like I was saying before, I first started and I got the opportunity to do some of the programs with snakes and whatnot. So maybe at this point I'll bring out my special guest. So hopefully I don't terrify anybody. <laughs> I apologize. Um, so hopefully everybody can see him. Maybe. Okay. I don't know if you have a free hand to stop screen sharing, then your image will be larger for everyone as well. Well, I'll keep him out until the very end and then um, well, I'll make him a little bit bigger at that point. <laughs> maybe at this point you might be slightly more engaged. So there, I've already um, proven my point that <laughs> animals do engage. But that was one of the other than just wanting to work with animals and be a biologist. That was one of my that's one of my main drivers to continue doing what I do. Because, you know, biologists ourselves can do all this work and care for the animals the way we do. And on the path that we're at really need to inspire visitors and guests all around the world why they should think the way we do or why they should want to protect different environments. And even just holding the snake right now, it might make some of you like, oh my God, why is that woman holding a snake? Why is that snake in that woman's house? Um, but it, it's really, we're all doing this because we want to show people, um, we want to show people the importance of these different animals. And um, it's not that hard to change uh, an item that you might be buying. It might not, it's not that hard to, you know, take a different mode of transportation somewhere. It's not, not that hard to, you know, just think about how you, shh, of course she starts barking right now. <laughs> it's not that hard to change your mindset in just a small way to really impact what we're doing with our environment. So, I mean, Every time I get to stand in front of somebody with a snake or a bird or uh, feed a shark or um, show somebody our behind the scenes area, it, it's just, it's a really cool feeling to be able to, to do that. And, and you just see, like, you don't even have to say anything. It's just showing people how amazing our natural world is and how, how, um, why we should protect these things. There we can see his little face. <laughs> but we we do I have a couple of little photos here so um, we do that through our programming we do that through things like this um, by showing the work that we're doing and um, how we're actually way more connected to the environment than most are and Especially, you know, for example, with something like snakes, people are like, how can I possibly be the same as a snake? Well, in a very short story, um, you're very much closely related to a snake because they need all the same things that you do. And you probably wouldn't have a lot of the things that you, you eat um, without snakes. Um, and that's the case for a lot of animals. Um, we all, they all play a very important role in everything that we do in our daily lives. Um, so by, by us creating the habitats that we do and really showcasing um, the amazing things that animals do, um, that's how we really inspire people. And that's why we continue to do what we're doing. Um, and then some of the stuff that we're doing behind the scenes, this is my friend, Chris. Uh, he's one of our senior biologists that works in the propagation team. And behind the scenes, we have a very um, frog program, um, Oregon spotted frogs and northern, northern leopard frogs. And we work closely with various groups within BC um, to, uh, as you can see in that red tub there, um, 
rear tadpoles from eggs and then release them back to the wild. And uh, it's, it's a really cool program that we're a part of. And it's quite amazing that, um, you know, we're able to release frogs back into the wild because, you know, some people don't even realize that there's frogs in their backyard. Um, they don't even realize there's snakes in their backyard. Yes, there's snakes in your backyard. We have nine here in BC, <laughs> but I assure you that they'll leave you alone. But it's, we're doing a lot of things behind the scenes that are, you know, just like this frog program that are there to uh, really, you know, inspire people to want to take action and um, protect not just their local environments, but their far away environments like the tropics, like the Caribbean, um, Hawaii, uh, um, Australia, um, Amazon rainforest, all those places. Like most people have never been there in their lives, right? But we really want to just show people why they should care about those things. So um, that's all I have. I'll take my screen share off here as long as I don't wreck wreck something here. Danica will tell me if I wrecked it. Okay. That is looking great. Thank you, Andrea. You're welcome. Um, the, one of the first questions that um, we got in a couple of times is, A, what kind of snake are you introducing us to here and that you're holding, as well as what kind of snake was in that second to last photo that you shared? <laughs> ah, yes. So um, this is a ball python or a royal python. Um, his name is George. Uh, he's about... 12 to 15 years old. Um, he's a rescued snake. I've had him seven years now, I guess. Um, he, uh, yeah, so we actually have these at the aquarium. They're part of our animal ambassador program. Uh, so if you've ever seen my face before, you might have seen me in a blog post or on some various news outlet talking about snakes because World Snake Day is actually coming up on July 16th, just in case anybody forgot. <laughs> Um, and that other picture that you saw, the orange snake, that's a uh, Brazilian rainbow boa. Uh, they're actually considered one of the most beautiful snakes in the whole world, which I think they are. They're pretty, pretty beautiful looking snakes. Wonderful. Thank you. Well, hopefully everyone will save the date in their calendar for World Snake Day. That's always a great day. And I think we have a wonderful video on our YouTube channel, too, from last year. So if you need a little bit of an extra dose of snakes in your life, you can probably see Andrea in that video too. Um, so again, we're really looking forward to your questions. Thank you so much for everyone that's saying hello to George in the chat right now. You're definitely welcome to send your messages there or to put any of your questions in the Q&A. One question that came in a little earlier in today's program was, Andrea, do you ever need to move animals between exhibits or even add new animals to exhibits? Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, we obviously try not to move animals too much just because that's their home and we want to leave them in their home to establish that. But sometimes we have to move them, like if we have to do renovations on something or um, maybe they're more suitable to a different exhibit. Uh, but lots of our, our habitats are created for that specific animal or the area that they live in. Um, but of course, you know, sometimes just like we get sick, uh, sometimes animals have to be moved out for that reason because they're not feeling so well. And so we want to keep them in a quiet, safe space behind the scenes that we can uh, treat them. We have some of the best veterinarians in the world helping us, helping us do that. Um, which is why I said sometimes we're like doctors or nurses at the, be at the beginning. Um, but yeah, and like sometimes that's that's why we'd have to move an animal out. Um, yeah, so it's not like an all the time thing, but it definitely once in a while we have to do that. Thank you. And actually, well, there's a few questions regarding moving animals. Was the Mata Mata recently moved into the tropics? A few people are remembering it being in that cylindrical habitat. Yeah, so, um, well, originally we actually thought that turtle was a he, and then turns out that she's a she. <laughs> um, so we 
we just, we, she was having a little bit of a, a rough day. Um, and then we, we discovered, and this is something that we do all the time. We are discovering new things about animals and the way we need to care for them because there isn't sometimes a lot of information out there about, uh, about animals. And really that's one of the, um, I guess, key, most important things about aquariums and zoos is that we are sometimes the only source of information about some of the animals in the world and like how they work and why they do what they do. And so, but like just learning a bit more about her, because Matamatas are, 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 are relatively, um, un, I mean, they're, they're quite popular to see, but there isn't always a lot of information about them. So just learning a bit more about her, we learned that maybe she just wanted to be alone. She didn't want to be with all these fish and she wanted to be in something just a little bit more deeper that had some more sand and an area that she could get out. Monomatas actually are a very unique turtle in the sense that they don't really bask. Lots of turtles do. Um, so she's kind of like, um, like sea turtles. Sea turtles only come out to say lay their eggs. They don't really bask, say like the turtles that you might see in parks around your local city. Um, so she, she's doing very well in there. Um, she is an Amazonian turtle, so it's a perfect place for her to be. Um, and she gets to be by herself, which Matamatas really like being by themselves. Wonderful. Well, I'm sure a few people can agree with that. <laughs> um, and so we have lots of great curious questions about the animals that you help look after. Um, one question coming in from Evelyn was, do all snakes shed their skin? Uh, I really don't like using the word all just because there's usually some sort of exception out there. But as far as I know, that is a thing that all snakes have to shed their skin. I just say that very hesitantly because there's probably going to be some weird snake out there that doesn't. Um, but just like people, I mean, if you didn't really know that yet, you do shed your skin. You just do it pretty much every day. Uh, that's what you're vacuuming and sweeping up all the time. It's not just dust, it's your skin. <laughs> Whereas snakes just do it in a very much more, I think, clean way. And they do it all at once. And it's like peeling off their, well, it's like taking a sock off. You just peel it off backwards. I remember the first time I actually got to watch a snake shed their skin. 15 years later, I am still fascinated by watching a snake shed their skin. It is, it is one of the coolest things ever because they shed their eye scale off and they just like slowly peel it back from it's just, it's really, really cool. It's something that they have to do. It's something that means that they're growing. Um, so George here does it just like most snakes every month and a half to two months, just depending on how old they are and how healthy they are. Um, but yeah, it's snakes are technically indeterminate growers. So they'll continue to shed through their life and they'll continue to grow um, little bits at a time. George most likely will just continue to get fatter. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, and we also have some questions coming in about some of the other animals. One from Neil was, what is it like to take care of the caiman at the aquarium? Ah, yes. Um, actually, we were just in the caiman exhibit the other day. Um, the caiman is... I would just like to point out that, you know, we, we we don't really intervene in our animals' lives that much. Like, obviously there's some exception, exceptions to that. For example, our parrot, um, very much rely on our interaction with them, their lives and be in the happy state that they're at. Um, but with a lot of the animals, we really, you know, give them what they need just to thrive. Um, but we leave them to their own devices kind of to, to do what they, what, what they, um, but in terms of, uh, she's a really cool, they're really cool critters. Like you never quite know what they're thinking because they're always just staring at you and you're, you're like, are you thinking you want to eat me today? I don't know. Um, but she's a really cool caiman. I mean, most people think that she's not alive. I think she's a rope with a remote control. I can assure you she is very much alive. Um, but she is, it's not as scary as you think. 
Um, we had to get in there the other day to fix something in her habitat and to um, fix up the plants that were that are in back there. Um, and she very nicely just sat there and just waited for us to do what we needed to do. And then we safely got out and it was just like a normal day. Um, we do the same thing with our anacondas. Uh, it takes, like I said, it takes quite a lot of people to do those things. So it's not just, you know, we go in and hang out with the caiman. Uh, we have shields, we have all kinds of things that protect us from, from her, but also to protect her from us so that she feels safe. Um, other than that, I mean, she, we give her lots of different food items. She's very curious about what we're doing all the time because, you know, we water the plants in there and we feed the fish uh, almost every day. And uh, it's, for us, it's just like a regular everyday thing. But I guess for some people they are like, oh my God, you're ready for the cave-in. But it's just like any other animal. It's just, it, she just requires some different care um, just because, you know, she could actually hurt us if she really wanted to, but um, we don't ever set ourselves up for that situation because we don't want to hurt them either, obviously. Wonderful. And I, we're almost going to wrap up for today's program, but a couple of more questions that are coming in was, what, any updates or any news on how the sloths are doing? <laughs> I knew I was going to get a sloth question in there. <laughs> I knew it. Um, sloths are, again, one of those solitary critters. They could really care less about what's happening around them. Um, there's still two of them that we still have, Sally and Hurricane. Um, they're still out in the trees, still sleeping all day long. Um, they still come and eat their greens. Um, so if you didn't know, they usually eat lettuce, bok choy, steamed yam and carrot, uh, apple, or stuff like that. Um, yeah, still living the good life in there. <laughs> Just sleeping most of the time. That sounds like a pretty good way to go. Um, and with the Vancouver Aquarium reopening this weekend, and part of that visit is walking through all of these beautiful exhibits that you've been giving us a sneak peek into, is there anything that you would suggest people keep an eye out for if they're coming to visit in the near future? Ah, okay. Well, I mean, obviously, I think the first gallery you have to go into is the tropics gallery. So <laughs> we're number one. I mean, but um, we do have some brand new exhibits that either open just before spring break or we have opened up um, during our closure. So that exhibit I showed at the kind of near the beginning uh, with all the plants in it, that's a very, a very new habitat for us. Uh, so you'll see that when you come out of the Amazon, uh, just across from the giant fish. Um, and it, it has these really cool fish in it called glass catfish. So literally think glass fish. Uh, they're completely see-through um, and they're right in the front. But they're really, really neat fish to check out. And then just on the other side of that, um, of that exhibit, we have a relatively new one. They're called upside down jellyfish. So literally think jellyfish, but flipped upside down. Um, they're really, really cool little critters. Uh, they just um, had a new, a new animal join them um, called our, with our tube, anem tube anemones. I can't say that properly most of the time, but the, they cut really cool purple colors. Very interesting exhibit to check out for sure. Um, just everything in the aquarium is cool, man. Like, I just, I think being able to spend so much time in the galleries myself over the last few months, everyone is working really hard to, well, we have been all working very hard to keep the animals healthy and happy for when all of you can come back and visit us. And um, everything is, is now you're going to get to see absolutely everything when you walk through. Um, so... Those are just a few highlights, but there's lots of really great things to see and check out. Wonderful, thank you so much. Well, hopefully um, we'll see many of our audience members in person over the next few weeks. And thank you so much, Andrea, for sharing with us what it's like to be a biologist and what biologists do for the Vancouver Aquarium and that that work is constantly ongoing, whether it's been while we've been closed to the public or now that we're reopening. And it's so important and it's great to kind of share 
that love of animals with everyone. So thank you so much. I'm going to just bring up a couple of closing images here on my screen share and a big thank you to our audience. And if you'd like to send a thank you in the chat to Andrea for joining us today, we would love to you know, hear that from you and hear what your experience was like. If you have been following along with some of our Tales from the Deep programs. We now have a YouTube gallery of them where you can see past programs and you'll see Andrea's program hopefully up there in the next little bit. And so you can always share it with friends or family or anyone else that would like to connect and see what has been going on with OceanWise research and the work going on at the Vancouver Aquarium. And so we were so pleased to have Andrea joining us this week. And next week, we are going to be joined by Emily Anderson from our Shoreline Cleanup team to be talking all about squashing litter bugs and the pursuit of cleaner communities. And so we hope to see many of you back on July 2nd at 1 p.m. for the next program there. As we enter summer for many folks, we are continuing to offer our online ocean live streams from the wet lab. <laughs> and so we are going to be talking about the wild west coast on Monday and exploring our Arctic on Thursday at 11 a.m. And so you can keep an eye out for some of those programs as they're coming up. I again want to thank everyone for joining us and being part of this wonderful program as we are in our 10th episode today. Um, and to continue to acknowledge that OceanWise is reflecting and looking at ways that we can continue our work in allyship towards racial justice and a more equitable society. And we will be continuing to share any um, thing that we learn with you and we appreciate you doing the same and so you can always find out more information on our aqua blog at aquablog.ca and again we want to stay connected through no matter what the world throws at us these days um, and you can always find out more about the programs that we're offering at ocean.org slash learn online or check us out on Twitter at OceanWiseEDU. And while we are so thrilled to be able to offer programs like this and you know, reopen our doors to so many of you coming back, um, we still have a long way to go in our Save the VA campaign. And so you can always see more ways to connect with us by visiting VanAqua slash SaveVA slash community to see what initiatives are going on throughout the summer. So thank you again to everyone. We can say thank you and goodbye to Andrea and to George, who's doing a beautiful job on screen. Thank and you everyone for joining us. We hope to see you next week. Okay. Bye-bye, everybody.